Welcome everyone to Textiles and Tea with the Ham Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising Marketing Manager and I'm the host of the Textiles and Tea for today. Today, Textiles and Tea is sponsored by the Textile Museum Journal. Go to their website and learn more about their upcoming interview series. Um, there's all kinds of information there on their website. We welcome your questions. Um, we will try to get to as many as we can. We always have more than we can. We usually do that toward the last 15 minutes of this session. Please use the Q&A and not the chat button. It just gets lost in chat. So put it in Q&A and we'll get to as many as we can. Happy Groundhog Day. Um, I understand that Ponsatonic Phil saw a shadow. The bad news is more winter, but the good news is today we have Laura Viata here as our guest. Laura's from Texas. She is a hand weaver, a fiber artist, a teacher, and she specializes in using a lot of natural fibers, primary linen and silk. Um, she's best known for her work using a weaving technique called transparency. And she's now exploring the old Mormon technique. Laura was a lawyer and took a break from her career, found weaving, and that was the end of being a lawyer. She was an artist in residence at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. You may have seen her work in exhibits throughout the US and she has exhibited several times at Convergence. So we want to welcome Laura today to Textiles and Tea. Hi, Hello. Laura. Hi. Welcome to Textiles and Tea. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Okay, our first question as always, what is your favorite tea? Well, I am drinking right now my favorite daytime tea, which is Twining's Lady Grey. Um, oh. It's a black tea with uh, bergamot, orange, and lemon, and it's just delicious. Now, later this evening, I'll have my favorite nighttime tea, which is Celestial Seasoning Sleepy Time Lavender. That's my nighttime ritual to have a cup of that before I turn in. Well, great. Um, let's start off with, if you can tell us how you got started in weaving. Well, you know, it was really just happenstance, really. Um, there's nothing like this in my family. You know, no, none of my relatives were weavers or anything like that. But when I was in law school, one of my classmates and one of my study buddies was married to the woman who was the owner of the uh, local weaving shop. And when I would go to their house for study group sessions, I would see her looms and was just fascinated with what she was doing. And I was looking at that thing, you know, I wanna do that. I don't wanna do this other stuff that I'm doing. So it took me probably a, a, almost another 15 years to get around to the point where I had the space in my life to learn to weave. Um, and it, it happened uh, in the early 90s when I was taking a short break from, from lawyering. And um, I just discovered it and I've never looked back. It's been, now I have continued to work, but I haven't continued, but I put my main focus on developing as a fiber artist. Oh, that's a great story. That's a great story. Okay, you talk about how you are most at home with transparency weaving, that yes. technique. Would you give a brief description of transparency weaving technique that you use? And um, I think we have an image of Moonlight 1 and 2. That's a good example of that. And it has the detail there next to it. So can you say something about transparency weaving? Yes, I mean, uh, the, the main thing about transparency is that it's characterized, as you can see, by opaque pattern areas contrasting with sheer background. I kind of refer to transparency as tapestry light. Um, you're using tapestry techniques to do the inlay, but um, it's, a, it's a much faster process than tapestry, obviously. I mean, the warp plays a very, very big role in transparency where it does not in, in tapestry weaving. Um, it's really, uh, transparency is a 
primarily about that contrast between the positive space where the design is and the negative space that's sheer. And there's lots of exploration you can do with that. The pieces you just saw have color in them, um, but that, that was done for a show where they were gonna be hanging a little bit out from a wall and lit from the front and not backlit. If you were gonna put them in windows or just hanging in, in neutral space where they would have light coming from the back, that would tend to kind of kill the color. So what, what I think transparency is really mostly about is about the positive negative contrast about form and while you can use color in it that's not the primary element the the light and shadow as you could probably see in the image that you showed also plays a huge role and that what you were seeing a lot of in that picture were the shadows that the positive space was casting on the wall and that changes throughout the day as the light changes so there's a dynamic quality to those pieces that i really like i should have asked this what Give us a rough estimate of the size of those pieces. You know, like oh. just looking at them, you don't know if they're six inches or six feet, you know? Right, right. Each of those panels is about 15 inches wide by five feet long. Oh, okay. You know, okay. Roughly. Right. Um, so they're large pieces and okay. you know, they're companion pieces. And I don't know if you noticed from the from the image that you showed, but the two images are the inverse of each other. What's positive space in one is negative space in the other. So they're companion pieces and meant to be displayed together. Whitney, can you put those back up again? I'm sorry. I'm making life's Whitney, life's, Whitney's life miserable by doing that. Thank you, Whitney. Yeah. So, yeah. so you can see the, the detail is from the piece on the left. So they're, they're the inverse of each other and you can see the shadow being cast on, on the wall. Okay, all right. So I, I like that effect with transparency. We don't, we were, as you talk about positive and negative space, um, that contrast of light and dark um, is, those modalities are important in any kind of artwork. I mean, they're like the basics when you go to art school, that positive, negative, ground, background, and that kind of thing. Um, you talked some about a puzzle earlier when we were practicing. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Talk a little bit about how that puzzle reflects that concept for you or how you use this puzzle in your work. Oh, this is this is just this incredible design tool. You know, in, in my in my paying job, my job with which I make a living, I've been traveling a lot. And so I go through a lot of um, airport gift shops. <laughs> and this is one I found in an airport gift shop. It's a little puzzle. You can see there's nine blocks and they all have the same designs on each well, on, on the different faces of the block, there's, you know, six different faces with six different designs and you can flip those blocks around. And as the, the um, little schematic on the right shows that, you, you know, any way you flip it around, it works, you mm -hmm. know, you, it creates a design and it's all about the contrast between positive space and negative space. I've used this little puzzle, I can't tell you how many times to create uh, cartoons for trans transparencies and it's always fun because I can do you know the the um the, the one piece and then do its inverse for a companion piece and you know it's it's been a fun little tool to use I have other things that I use too I have a little trivet that's in a spiral design that it, it comes apart and I've used that design for um several pieces <laughs> So I'm always looking for little things like that. Well, your and timing is perfect because one of the pieces I love is the Simple Gifts and it has spirals in it. It just is such a beautiful flow and repetition. Um, can you say something? What was your inspiration for this? Well, this was the little trivet that we talked about. Uh -huh. and, um, and you were talking about positive negative space too. One very valuable tip that I got when I was sort of a tapestry weaver wannabe was I took a, a workshop from Jean-Pierre Narchette and Yael Lurie 
and she was talking about design and she mentioned um, that when she is designing for tapestry, she is designing from the negative space that she's thinking about what, what that is going to be um, rather than about the positive space. And I think that most of us probably tend to do the exact opposite. And throughout my, my time in designing for transparency, I've incorporated more and more her concept of working from the negative space. And that's sort of what you see happening here is that I took the little trivet and I flipped it and moved it around and oriented the little spirals um, that are squared off at one end or the other differently. But when I put the design together, I was looking at and the negative space was not appealing to me. And, you know, I, I was trying to figure out what I needed to do with it, but it was just too much you know, rows of spirals. And that's when it occurred to me to insert what you could probably see are the little squares of color mm -hmm. um, between each one of the spiral motifs. And I don't know if it's very apparent from the image, but they grade from red orange at the top to blue violet down at the bottom. So it's just this little hint of color. This, this piece was actually a commission and, and it's hanging, um, in, in one of my friend's home in Galveston these days. And um, so I'm gonna try to, I forgot where I was going with, with, with that story. But anyway, I, I was, you know, just, as I said, just not happy with the negative space and sort of designing from that, that point. And I realized that I'm starting to do that more and more when I create ideas for transparency. Well, talking about the, the pattern and color that you used in that one, the next image is another one I absolutely love. It's called Elements of Surprise, and it is a lot of color. Can you talk some about your use of color here? Yes, and this is, this is um, a, complete, a, a completely different uh, part of my exploration in weaving. Um, I'm very fascinated by the elements of transparency, but I'm also truly a colorist at heart. That, that's what my work tends to be mostly about these days. And this is a really good example of where my exploration is going, that I'm focusing on how our eyes see color and how we make blends through the phenomenon that's known as optical mixing. You know, in, in optical mixing, if you look at this piece, what, you, what you're reading probably is an area of green, an area of a red orange, and then two areas that appear to be rather goldish in hue. But when you get up really close and inspect that, you'll see that there is no gold, there is no yellow in this piece. Other than the black background, it's nothing but the green and the yellow orange. And it's our eyes that are making those areas where those two colors come together appear to be yellowish gold. And, you know, this is something that, that it, it takes a lot of time for weavers to understand uh, about the way our eyes see color because they don't see color the way we're traditionally taught color theory. Mm -hmm. We're taught color theory the way most painters are taught it with red, blue, and yellow being the primary colors. But when you're dealing with light and when you're dealing with the, the receptors in our eyes called the cones, the primary colors we're dealing with are red, green, and blue. Yellow is a secondary color in those mixes. And understanding how that happens you know, answers a lot of questions about what's going on when warp crosses weft, because what we're really doing is essentially the same thing that the pointillist painters were doing. We're taking little specks of individual color, you know, which is the warp crossing weft, the interlacement, and then we're asking our eyes to fuse those into the result that we see, because uh, at a certain point, you can't see the difference between the red and the green anymore. You're seeing the fusion. And so I've, I've worked very long and hard on that exploration, which has been which, um, uh, what most of my recent work is about. The technique you just saw there was Theo Warman technique. 
So I've been exploring that a lot in my recent works. It works really well for the type of blends that I'm doing. How big was that piece? Uh, it was about, let's see, 11, no, um, 11 by 17. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. It was, it was amazing. And I'm never, I'm always amazed when I see how colors change when they don't change just by what they're, that's an uh -huh. excellent example of that. Thank you. Now, I understand <clears throat> that you have three artists that have really influenced you. One is Annie Albers and then Joseph Albers, and then also Carlos Cruz Diaz. Now, I know, um, where would you say their influence is in this next piece called Momentum? Okay, this piece is entirely a Carlos Cruz Diaz influence. This okay. is what I was just doing in the in the element of surprise piece that you brought up before. Mm -hmm. um, I am, you know, blending colors. This is just a much more complex um, rendition of the sort of thing I was doing before. I'm layering, I'm, I'm, I'm putting one line of color right next to another one, right next to another one, right next to another one, and just continuing. And in this particular piece, I think I worked with about five total colors and, um, and moved them in a, in a rotation up through that piece and seeing the various blends they make. And what's really interesting about this too is, you know, depending on the relative lightness or darkness of the colors and how the, the various hues behave next to one another, some of the uh, areas seem to advance towards you, others seem to recede from you. And um, that creates a lot of depth in the piece. Now, the, the transparency that you showed, the moonlight one and two, that we saw at the at the beginning of the talk, that was inspired by Annie Albers. You know, I, she is just you know marvelous to me. Um, in that you know she was such a pioneer in the notion of the textile as fine art in itself. You know, regardless of independent of its function, and the design um, on those pieces with the flipped right triangles. Um, I got from her notebook that she kept at the later part of her life when she was no longer weaving. She was doing a lot of designing using right triangles and experimenting with different orientations and the effects that she could get with that. And that notebook has been published. It's available on Amazon. I, I don't know how many uh, people out there are aware of that, but so it's just a it's all about positive negative space. And it's just a fantastic treasure trove of ideas for the piece. So the textile itself as a fine art with a design that was created by Annie Albers it was the inspiration for that. Now, Joseph Albers was an incredible colorist, you know, in, in his own right. And he wrote one of the most important works called The Interaction of Color. Um, and that's just been kind of like my Bible, that and um, Johannes Eaton's Art of Color just have, are my go-to books for this. And he also did a, a series of studies with color called uh, Homage to the Square. And a lot of my work is just about the simple geometric form of the square. And that's pure Joseph Albers. And so, I mean, those three um, have really informed the way I'm working these days and given me a lot of ideas for, you know, how I want to pursue my work. Now this last piece, that momentum, was that Theo Mormon also? It was also Theo Mormon, yes. Okay. Okay. That's been a very useful technique for, for the work I'm doing. Now, someone um, was asking um, on the transparency, and I'm curious on the same thing on the Theo Mormon. Um, is it basically plain weave? Karen LeBlanc was asking that about the transparency, but the Theo Mormon, the same thing. It's basically plain yes, weave, right? Exactly. Both of them, both of them are plain weave. Uh, the transparency is just pure plain weave. I'm weaving my one three shed and then with, with fine thread that's the background, I'm leaving that shed open and I'm laying in my pattern weft in that same shed then making the two four shed, throwing the fine background um, pick and then laying in the pattern 
and then rinse and repeat throughout. Now, Theo Mormon is slightly different. It's the same thing. You've got a plain weed ground, but the, the background on Theo Mormon is opaque. It's not sheer. And, <laughs> um, and you use, uh, you have threaded in very fine tie down threads. Um, so I will weave the one three shed and then I'll close that shed, but leave tie downs up and then lay the pattern in underneath the tie down threads. So the, the, um, the, the plain weave ground is really not playing a huge role in the, it's not playing a role at all in, in the pattern that I'm laying on top of it. Only the very fine tie downs which show on the surface. So I can get, you know, cleaner colors that are not as influenced by what the background is. In transparency, the background does play much more of a role. We're kind of shifting gears here. <clears throat> you were a lawyer before you became a full-time weaver. Um, how do you think your training as a lawyer um, and training the way you think, because that's what I hear is that becoming a lawyer is trying to learn how to think in a certain way mm -hmm. has, and the, just the experiences of being a lawyer. How do you think those have impacted on you as an artist in your artist career, if at all? Yeah, that, that, that's a, a strange question. I mean, it, it, it's not without impact. And I'll, I'll tell you, I don't think that it impacts what I do as a weaver so much. I mean, I have obviously I have a very analytical mind and you know and so that's driven the things that I'm interested in but I would have done that whether I'd been a lawyer or not because that's just the way I am what what I think um, being an attorney has done for me and it's it's not unique to being an attorney it could be any type of work or, or profession but it's allowed me to free my weaving and my artistic pursuits from the burden of having to feed me. Okay, so I'm not trying to make a living doing this. Um, I'm not even trying to supplement my we my living doing this. I love to sell. I do sell. I'm just as happy as anybody else to sell my work, but that's not what motivates me to go to the studio every day. So I feel like I can weave what I want to weave, not what I think other people want me to weave. And, and I think that, you know, my work is more authentic and better for it. The other thing that um, being an attorney did for me, um, and this was directly related to law practice, is it led me into teaching. Yeah, because I never had a really very happy relationship with the practice of law. It just didn't suit my personality. I didn't care for it. I did it for 12 years and I decided, you know, I'm just not good at this sitting in an office, pushing paper, arguing with people all day long. That's just not me. So I, I got out of that. And my, my work has really been centered around teaching ever since I've taught at the university level. Um, uh, business law and commercial law classes. And the last 15 years, I've spent doing seminars and training classes for um, corporate clients around things like equal employment opportunity and workplace diversity and um, performance management and things like that. So, and, and so it led me into teaching, which has also been a very valuable part of my weaving career. I do a lot of uh, do a lot of teaching. At least I did before COVID. Well, I have to say I, that's how I know you. Is that I took your class in um, Tampa at Convergence in down in Tampa in two thousand eight. We were both very young children back then, but yes, you did were. a great job. You were a great class. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody wants to know from artists is how do you stay creative. Um, and do you ever get a block and how do you get through your blocks and stay uh, passionate, I guess, about your work? Yeah, that's yes, of course I get blocked. Everybody gets blocked. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just it's part of it. And there have been times that I've been so frustrated that I've just sort of wanted to chop my looms up and throw them out the window. You know, it just. Yeah. Um, and. <laughs> You know, I, I've had this conversation with a lot of my weaving friends because it seems like, you know, every time I put a warp on, I see it like no matter how many 
years you do this, how many warps you go through, couldn't I ever just once weave something that I didn't have some major issue with the warp or the process or something like that? It's just like, oh, it's so frustrating. But um, I love to weave. And so that keeps me going. But honestly, I mean, the, the advice I was given um, once, and you know, I don't even remember which mentor gave it to me. It may have been James Kohler because I, I did study with, with him a, a little bit, not like Rebecca did, but I did go to, to Santa Fe a few times to, to take some classes with him. And, you know, his, his, I think it was him, but whoever advised me, which is just do something. If you're blocked, it doesn't matter. You don't have to top yourself every time like I do something and it's so successful and I think oh my god I'll never be able to do something that good again and then I block and I think like Laura get over yourself and just get in the studio and make something you know it doesn't have to be just put on a, a plain weave table mat and usually just the process of using my hands and engaging in the weaving motion triggers ideas and that's kind of what I did with my show. I, I put on, you, you showed a, a piece uh, early on that had little squiggles and stuff on. I thought I'd just put something on. I decided on a little design and I started weaving that. And as I wove it, more and more and more designs occurred to me. And then it occurred to me to go and start doing some of those um, chromatic moments, the Carlos Cruz Diaz pieces. And then that occurred to me to go take it somewhere else. So staying in motion i think is is the main takeaway that i would have from this just do it <laughs> well i think i heard hundreds of weavers going oh my gosh she has that problem too <laughs> everybody has that problem you know we all think we're the only ones that have just that once problem. no mistakes just once oh please you know there is nothing more heart-wrenching than taking a piece off the loom and discovering a treadling error right in the middle of the piece that is and i'll tell you a funny story also about the um the transparency you, you saw at the beginning. You know, I there was a series of six of those pieces that I did and I had them all on the same warp. And I when I cut it off the loom and I was finishing them and everything and in the, the piece that was actually the detail, I noticed right smack in the center of a shear area, I had had a broken thread or something that I hadn't noticed. And there was a big old hole where that broken thread had been. And I looked at that and I thought there's, I thought and tried, I thought there is no way I can fix this. It'll be so obvious, it is, this is not repairable. So I had to sit down and reweave that piece. I mean, this was all for a show. So I thought it's either I eliminate that piece from the show, which affects the whole series, or I reweave the piece. And so fortunately, I enjoyed weaving that piece because, you know, I did, in fact, reweave it. So, yeah, we all have that problem. Uh, you know, As they say here, bless your heart. <laughs> Ouch. Oh, okay. yeah. um, a couple of people have been asking, and I'm curious about this, too. Where do you get your yarn and do you dye your own yarn? Uh, to, do I dye my own yarn? I do not. Um, I used to. Um, but... I've gone through a series of downsizings in my, my living space and in my studio space. And at, at certain point, I could just no longer accommodate a dye studio as well as a weaving studio. And then I also really have found that these days there are so many lovely commercially dyed yarns that you can get. And I like to challenge myself with creating color through optical mixing by blending colors on my bobbins or spools rather than trying to find the perfect color. So I, I like to I like to engage in that exercise. I'm rarely using just one um, just one thread or one color in anything that I do. Um, where do I get them? Okay, well, the silks are uh, I get primarily from Redfish Dye Works. 
Um, their, their colors are so lovely. I get, I get if I, on the few occasions that I'm gonna dye myself, um, Trimway silk is a, is a source for my, the natural yarn. And I get a whole lot of that anyway through uh, the Lone Star Loom Room which is where I get my linens and my cottons. And I've been so fortunate because I've had two wonderful sources of fiber in my backyard. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lone Star Loom Room is Houston based. And then I get a lot of the metallics and novelty yarns that I use. And I've really started falling in love with metallics these days. I've been getting those from Giovanna Imperia Designs and she's also Houston based and within 10 minutes of where I live. So I've just had, you know, two candy stores near me. I think unfortunately they may both be retiring. I don't know. I'm you know, waiting to see what happens, but um, those have been my, my sources primarily. Um, Anything else? I think that that's really about it um, in lately in terms of my yarn sources. Well, we have some questions. Okay. Um, and I'm going to go through these. A couple, a couple of statements. Oh, well, question and um, a comment. First, Adele Harvey. Hello, Adele. Oh, right. We're excited oh, you're okay. on here. She just said that, um, she said, thank you, Laura, for being so open about the process of being creatively blocked. Sending warm greetings from the cold Northeast. <laughs> Adele, thank you for watching. It was lovely having you on here. And then this I love because Nadine Sanders is on here. And Nadine is, um, her focus is the Theo Mormon. Um, uh -huh. And yeah. she wanted to know, um, do you have another medium to work out artistic ideas besides weaving? Um, because somebody else was asking, do you use like a cartoon? So do you draw things out first? Do you do it on a computer? Do you use a cartoon? Uh, depends uh, on some, some things I do um, mm -hmm. on, on the, um, well, like on the Moonlight pieces, the Annie Albers inspired pieces, I did not. Um, I didn't need to, it's just right triangles. And so what I, what I did was I just made a, a, you know, there's only four different orientations that things can have, A, B, C, and D. And I just made this row is going to be A, C, B, D, and this one is going to be A, C, you know, D, A. And, you know, I just made the list of how I wanted them to go. Um, I worked it out on the loom, you know, just what my proportions, you know, how many step overs was I going to need, you know, to get the angle that I wanted, you know, to get the dimensions that I wanted for my triangles. And once I worked that out, then boom, it was all done. And I just had to look at my little key and say, okay, here, I'm going to put A, B, C, D and, and, you know, do it that way. And I did the same thing with the simple gifts piece with the flipped, um, mm -hmm. uh, um, spirals. Yeah. What were those things? Spirals. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just, you know, figure out which orientation I was going to use. Now with those, I did have a little cartoon for each one that I pinned underneath the piece and followed that. Uh, spirals, the spirals are really difficult to weave, but one of the things I was going to say about transparency that uh, it, uh, in contrast to tapestry that I really like about it is that it's a lot more forgiving than tapestry weaving is just because of the way the designs are built. Um, you know, tapestry is built a one, a one pass at a time. And a pass is both sheds. It's the one three shed and then the two four shed. You know, each pig is a half pass. And so you can get a solid line of weaving and tapestry. Transparency is built pick by pick. So the one three pick is, is, is one line of work and then the two four pick is another. So you're always either a step ahead or a step behind of your design depending on where you're, how you're going up with the, with the transparency. And that would be in Theo Mormon too because you've got the turns that are part of your design. So, um, I, I forget what point I was trying to make with that. I'm having a few little senior moments with this. It's but. just going with the flow. I think it's great. Well, I, a couple of people are asking about your scarf. It's like, all right, already, Christina and um, 
Ada, I'm gonna probably pronounce your name wrong. I'm sorry, Ada. Um, they wanna know, did you weave it and what yes. structure is it? And this is actually, I don't know if you can see up close. It's gorgeous. This is a transparency. Um, it, I don't know if it's showing, you know, the way I would want it to, but it's plain weave in the body of it. But at the edges, I've woven, um, these little areas or black areas are basically sheer. And then the, the little squares are inlaid. And so it's a, it's, this is, I don't, you know, I don't know if I recommend making scarves this way. It was very, it was very time consuming, which is why I kept this one rather than sell it. <laughs> but, um, but, it's, but it's fun. But that, that is something else you can do with transparency too. It's not just wall pieces or window things. You can do wearables with it. Um, I've done table linens with transparency. It really makes a cool looking table runner. Really? Uh -huh. yeah, I saw there's a jacket on your website. Is that transparency or is that? No, that's not. That's a really, really old piece. Okay. Um, it, that's just, uh, that's warp painted. And it's, uh, it's like a 16 shaft loom controlled design. Um, and yeah, that's, that piece dates back to like 2000, I think. Um, Debbie Cummings said, what about diversified plain weave? Because you do a lot of diversified. Yeah, plain. I do. I do. And she said, when do, you, when do you use this structure? I'm getting ready to use it um, uh, for my next project. Um, you know, the, the pieces that I did that were Carlos Cruz Diaz inspired are done in Theo Mormon, but it's occurred to me that I probably can use diversified plain weave to do the same thing. Um, it, it'll be a slightly different look, but then I'm into a more loom controlled uh, environment where it might go a little bit quicker. I, I use I use diversified plain weave a lot. I've just fallen in love with doing using uh, pickup on diversified plain weave. Also, you know, I don't need to a lot because I have a lot of shafts on my loom. But you know, when you have when I want to design that's even more complex than I can do on the shafts that I have, I love to use a pickup stick. It is so easy to do pickup with diversified plain weed because, you know, just because of the way it's threaded and, and the way it behaves. What do you normally use for your warp when you're doing uh, transparency or, or the diversified or uh, feel more okay. transparency? Yeah, with trans, all of my transparencies these days are done with 35 over two linen as my warp. Oh, okay. um, I get it from, it's Bakken's. I get it from the Lone Star Loom Room. Now with, with that weight of yarn, it's only available uh, in, in weaver lead put-ups in um, natural and half bleach. If you want colors or if you want black, that's a special order and they come on the little bobbin lace spools. And so I've got like 10 boxes of black bobbin lace spools sitting in my, in my stash right now to be used for that. So, and I set it at 18 ends per inch. That, that's like a perfect set. I have a reed that is specially made for that. If you're gonna do transparency folks, I, you know, I do not recommend slaying multiple ends per dent. It's gonna show in your fabric and it's either gonna to have to be part of your overall design plan or you're going to have to spend an awful lot of time picking them apart, which I'm not sure you want to do. So if you're gonna do a lot of transparency and use that weight of warp, which I like because it's a closer set. So it gives me a lot more design capability you know, because of the of the closeness of the set. So it's worth investing in a read, especially for that. And then on, on the uh, Theo Mormons, I was using 16 over two linen from Bakken's as my ground warp. And then my tie downs, um, I, use, I use 240 over two silk that I had gotten, I think, from Giovanna Imperia Designs. Now, I gotta tell you, that's really fine. And 
I did a few other pieces using 120 over two, and that's the one I would recommend um, rather than the 240. It's just really, really fine and can be, it can be hard to handle. And I don't find that the weight, well, I mean, it's like one is twice the size of the other, but they're both so fine, it doesn't really matter. So that I would suggest going with the 120, it's much easier to handle. Um, well, you talked some about your loom. And I'm assuming that's the loom behind you that you use. Yes. What is that? This is my baby. It's a it's a Louette Magato uh, 32 shaft loom. It's the um, smaller one, the 20, I think it's 28 inch weaving width um, and computer driven. Uh, the other looms I have, I, I have my, my emergency auxiliary loom is a uh, eight shaft Maycomber baby mac loom that's 20 inches wide. Love that loom. It's a nice, sturdy, albeit heavy uh, workshop loom. You know, moving it around is challenging, but it's worth it because it's a great weaving loom. And then I have a small Murex tapestry loom. And I have a four shaft Bluet Erica loom that um, is, I love it because you can pack it in a suitcase. And it, you know, if you need a loom for a workshop or for demo purposes, I can take that one with me. Well, you're talking about some of these smaller looms. Somebody was asking, Susan Freeman, nope, not Susan. Susan, we're gonna get to yours too. Um, uh, Sue Malvern said, do you test out ideas on swatches before committing to a large piece? Do you use the smaller looms to make test things or? Do I sample? Sample, sample's a dirty word. You know, you know, <laughs> I, you know I, I, I worked out like for the, the Annie Albers transparencies, I had to work out, you know, the, the dimensions, you know, for what I was weaving. Typically, I gotta say, I, I wish I were better a better sampler, but I'm not. You know, what I do, a lot, since a lot of my work is about color, I'm designing on, on my computer. A lot of times I'm using a Fiberworks PCW and, you know, you plug those colors in and you're gonna get a pretty good idea of what your piece is gonna look like. You know, so I, I do a lot of that Sometimes I'm pleasantly surprised. Other times I'm not so pleasantly surprised with what I get, but I've just gotten experienced enough with color and proportions and all of those sorts of things that I have a pretty decent idea of what I'm gonna get when it comes off the limb. So I, I don't really sample. I'm working out like uh, in the momentum piece that you showed that was Carlos Cruz Diaz inspired. I did sit down with a piece of graph paper and colored pencils and sort of sketch out, you know, where I wanted each of those blocks to go, mm -hmm. you know, and what the progression of them was going to be. I was not making that design up as I went along. But when I sat down to the loom to weave it, I was making decisions about what color am I going to use next. I was making those decisions as I went along. Um, a few other pieces that I've done, I, I think you showed a, a, a image of one of those. It had a border with stripes and a center area with squares and little squiggles and stuff. That was a series that I did where I knew I wanted to have you know, a two inch border and then a four inch center area. And, you know, if they were gonna have stripes or color gradations, I made those up as I went through the piece, but I had planned out what was going to go in the center because I had to, those are gonna be squares and more precise things that I had to be more definite about where I placed them. And, you know, I do a lot of thread counting you know, when I'm, when I'm weaving something like that, you know, where my step overs are. And so it's all done by number of threads per inch and I'm counting over where I need to be for each one. But some of it I'm doing as, as I go and some of it is pre-planned. I like that. You're flexible. Yeah. It's fun that way. It is. Um, Susan Freeman, getting back to Susan Freeman, she said, do you do Zoom type classes? She said her loom is still warped, ready for your CHC, 
CNCH 2020 class. Oh. Um, that's the Northern California, right? Yeah. Conference that got canceled. You know, I have, Bless your heart. I have not made the, the leap from um, in, into online classes yet. I've done some programs you know, shorter things, but, you know, I am, I'm so not a techie, and I just feel like, oh, you know, it's just fear factor with this, but I'm probably going to have to make that leap. Uh, tell her, if, if it makes you feel any better, I've received information from CNCH for 2022 um, that I'm going to submit for. I, I don't know if what I teach will fit with the way they're trying to structure the conference this time, but it was the transparency workshop I was going to teach, and I was really disappointed that I couldn't do it. <laughs> Wah. <laughs> oh, there's been a lot of wahs this year. Yeah, I know. I know. COVID has taken so much away. Well, you, you've been a tech pro for this. So, you know, you're on your way. <laughs> baby steps, baby steps. Right? Well, I had good coaching through this. <laughs> well, so, um, Carol uh, Davinsky has a question about, have you written the book or are you going to? Uh, I, I have been asked many times whether I intend to write a book about transparency, and um, I don't know is the answer to that. There's a, there's a wonderful book out there called, um, I think it's Sheer Delight by Dora May Casby, mm -hmm. um, and that's the only book I know out there that's about transparency. The, the, the thing about it is, is it's, you know, it's not as heavily technique driven as tapestry is. I'm just try, I'm trying to think, is there enough material for a book that would bring anything new to what's already out there? Right. I mean, Dora May's book is a beautiful gallery of uh, woven, tran uh, woven transparencies. And you know, she spends a little bit of time on technique. Um, so it's just it's something I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. Right now, right now, I've been through, you know, basically being, you know, involuntarily retired now because of, of the pandemic and getting through a solo show. And I just moved my studio. Y'all are seeing my, my set of my brand new studio at home. And right now, all I want to do is sleep and weave what I want to weave for a little while. So, you oh, know, speaking of think of it. Maybe what you want. You mentioned doing a commission. Do you do a lot of commission work? I have done some. Uh -huh. um, what I, did you I think? You like I doing commission? I don't um, promote myself as a commission weaver. If somebody asks me to do one, I'll listen to what it is that they want, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, see if it's the kind of project that I think that I can give them what they want and if it appeals to me. You know, I, I have no desire to get paid to do something that I don't enjoy doing. So um, I, it would all depend on what the project is. The ones that I've done, I've, I've enjoyed. You know, they've been kind of up my alley at things that I wanted to do. But, you know, well, that it depends, I guess, is the answer to that. A good, good lawyerly answer there. It depends. <laughs> I just saw that um, our friends at Lunatic Fringe, hello, Lunatic, Lunatics, uh -huh. um, they have acquired um, Giovanna Imperia's collection. Yes, um, yes, they have. And I, I neglected to mention that. And I'm really sorry that I that I did because, um, and, and Lunatic Fringe has also been a great source of yarns for me over my weaving history. The things I've been weaving with most recently have been the silks and the linens from Bakken's and um, Redfish and from Giovanna. But I have a lot of projects that I've used their um, tubular spectrum and their grayscale, which I totally love. So I'm sorry that I left them out as a, as a source. So, and they will continue to be a big source of mine since they've got a lot of Giovanna's pieces now. All right. Good plug there, Lunatic. <laughs> Hi, Michelle. Oh, and somebody said, repeat the name of the Sheer Delight, and that's Dora May Keys. Dora May Kaysby. I think that's how it's pronounced. It's K-A-S-B-E-Y. Yeah. 
Dora May. So Google it. Somebody else was asking about um, what is Theo Mormon, and we can't even get into all that. I encourage you to Google uh, Nadine Sanders has a book on it, and uh -huh. then uh, just put in Theo Mormon weaving, and you'll find a Theo Mormon book. Yeah, it's another it's another form of light tapestry. I, I think it's it's a way of of getting free designs more quickly than traditional tapestry. Okay, Mary and Anne both want to know about the tapestry behind you. Is that your work? Um, oh, the, the piece on the wall there? It's not a tapestry, it's a quilt. And no, it's not my work. Um, my sister gave this to me as a gift for my studio many, many years ago. Uh, she was living in Canada and one of her friends either was the artist or was related to the artist, uh -huh. you know, who, who did uh, some really fabulous art quilts. And she gave that to me as a gift. And I love it. You know, it's been with me every, everywhere. I love the colors and it's, but and it, it's right up my alley because it is the sort of thing I do. It's, it's color study, it's squares, it's, um, she knew me well. It, it looks like your work. It really does. I think that's why everybody said, is that yours also? Because with the curves and the shapes and everything. Okay. Somebody asked with transparency, have you investigated the Scandinavian weaving slash weavers? I'm not sure what that means. Um, you mean just, just Scandinavian techniques? Um, well, transparency, I think actually was devised by Scandinavian weavers. It is one, it is one of their um, um, signature techniques. And, you know, I've heard a lot of different stories about this and I'm not sure how many of those are true, but um, I have heard that during the Second World War that the weavers were wanted to continue their weaving, but they needed to use you know, smaller bits of yarn because it was, of course, much more scarce and requisition and everything. So that type of, of uh, weaving was developed, you know, during that period of time. I find that a little hard to believe um, because it just seems to me like this is a technique that would have been around for a long, long time. And there was a class I was going to take at Convergence this year um, about, you uh, a particular style of transparency weaving and uh, the name of the class is, is completely escaping me right now but um, you can take it in 2022 i am going to <laughs> and i even let y'all keep my money so i would not you know you'll back out on coming so i will be there <laughs> Well, Laura, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for being here today. This has been great. Uh, I feel like I've learned so much. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. If you want to learn more pleasure. about Laura and her work. And also, um, she has a lot of um, information about her classes and when we start having classes again and the exhibits that she's in. If you want to go to lauraviata.com. And I also want to thank the Textile Museum Journal for to sponsoring Textiles and Tea today. Their first series interview will be February the 17th. It's going to feature Dr. Alana Phipps. And she's going to talk about Andean textiles that reflect light. Does that not sound interesting? Um, go online and go to their website and learn more about that series of um, interviews that they're going to have. If you would like to sponsor Textiles and Tea or your company or your guild would like to sponsor an episode, please go to our website at weavespindie.org. Textiles and Tea is supported by the generous donations to Fiber Trust. So if you would like to see more programming like this and other kind of programming, please support HGA by becoming a member or donating or both at, at weavespindie.org. If you missed part of this or you want to share it with someone or you want to watch it again to get all the information that Laura had for us, it was a lot, uh, please uh, go to the HGA uh, Facebook page. It's been recorded and it's on there. Next week, please join me. We're going to have tea with Natalie Meebach. She does these extraordinary fiber sculptures. You'll love them. So I look forward to seeing you all next week. Take care. Happy tea.